Hello, everybody. Welcome to ASLAB 83. I'm Rafael Chevier, a research and PhD student at Azulejo Network Research, which is part of ARTISH, uh, the Institute of Art History of the University of Lisbon. On behalf of my research group and the National Azulejo Museum, the organizers of the ASLAB lecture series, I'll be hosting this session. And today we have a very special guest, Patricia Blessing. Hi, Patricia. Hello. Uh, Patricia is Assistant Professor of Islamic Art History in the Department of Arts and Archaeology at Princeton University. Author of many books, her current project, Space of Artifice, Objects and Interior Design in Anatolia, addresses the relationship between objects, design and interior spaces in the Islamic architecture of Anatolia from the late 12th, 12th century to late 15th centuries. Larger issues to be addressed in the resulting book are those of interior design and planning, multi-sensory perception of space of objects. So without further ado, please, Patricia, feel free to start. The screen is yours. <laughs> So thank you, Rafaela, for the introduction, and uh, thank you to, to you and to Rosario for, uh, for the invitation to speak here today. It's a, a real pleasure, pleasure uh, to be here and um, present some of uh, what is part, of, in, in a way, part was sort of an a extension of my uh, previous book project on 15th century Ottoman architecture, but I think some of it will again be relevant on uh, what I am working on now. In the second quarter of the 15th century, a new phenomenon emerged almost concurrently in the Mamluk and Ottoman realms. Tiles with underglaze painted blue and white decoration, mostly hexagonal in shape, used as architectural ornamentation. The motifs of these tiles were inspired in part by Lei Tian and early Ming Chinese porcelain, which was imported in large quantity, although it is also important co to consider the earlier reception of Chinese motifs in Islamic art, particularly in the context of the Mongol Empire beginning in the mid 13th century. The tiles appeared most prominently in monuments in Damascus and Edirne, but individual tiles were also used in other locations, including Cairo and Bursa. Today, I will discuss these tiles within the larger framework of new interactions between the Mediterranean and the Eastern Islamic world following the Timur expansion in the early 15th century, when connections between the Mamluk and Ottoman courts, which had intensified over the course of the 14th century, uh, <clears throat> reached a new peak. Within this context, in which diplomats and scholars frequently moved back and forth between the Ottoman and Mamluk realms, similar trajectories must be considered for makers, that is, those who produced monuments and their uh, decoration. While these individuals do not usually appear in the written narratives of the time, they must have been involved in the same networks extending between the Ottoman, Mamluk, Timur, and Karakoyunlu realms, and sometimes they did leave uh, signatures on uh, their works, a few of which we will see today. Before I move into the material, I should also say that um, the sources of the motifs on many of those tiles are um, ceramic or effectively um, uh, more correctly porcelain vessels from China, such as uh, this bowl you see over here. There are um, examples of wall tiles also produced uh, in the 14th, 15th and 16th century in China, um, but none of these tiles have been found uh, in uh, either historical collections or archeological excavations uh, within the Ottoman and Mamluk realms. So what was exported as both as trade and as diplomatic gifts were really uh, the vessel, not those tiles. Um, I should also say that there is a, a Timurid part of the story of blue and white tiles. Um, the most, the most um, well-known example of which is the so-called Chinichane uh, built in Samarkand 
by uh, the Timur ruler uh, Ulukbek, probably in the 1420s. This is described in um, primary sources, um, but very little uh, archaeological evidence for it exists. Now, I have to say that since I wrote this paper, um, there has been new work on this site by uh, Elena Paskaleva at the University of Leiden. And I have not yet seen um, that work. So uh, I think there will be also a slight shift in that narrative as uh, Dr. Paskaleva does more of this work and uh, also eventually um, publishes it. Uh, so just to say that what I'm uh, showing you today is really the Ottoman and Mamluk uh, material for the most part, but there is more to the story. So I will begin by examining the use of blue and white underglaze uh, painted tiles in Ottoman monuments uh, in Edirne uh, and then Bursa. I will present an overview of the tiles produced or believed to have been produced in Cairo and Damascus. There, um, there are also many individual tiles which are found in various museum collections that are attributed to Cairo and or Damascus, and most of which have no secure provenance to either of those cities. I will argue that the stylistic commonalities between these tiles points to the shared interest in certain forms of Eastern uh, read, uh, Chinese aesthetics in the Ottoman and Mamluk contexts. Since Ottoman and Mamluk architecture differ significantly in other regards, plans, shapes of domes, the materials used uh, for the construction itself and in other parts of architectural decoration, intersections such as these apparent in the blue and white tiles are easily overlooked more so because many of these tiles are no longer in situ. Now, in, in the Ottoman context, the largest surviving number of the early of early 15th century blue and white tiles appears in the multifunctional tea plant, uh, so-called convent mosque of Murad II in Edirne, known as the Muradia, which was completed in 1435-36. And uh, here you just see one section of them and the exterior, and here's all of it. So it's these three walls and the mihrab we'll be talking about. The walls, of it, the walls of its Qibla Ivan are decorated with hexagonal blue and white underglaze painted tiles interspersed with triangular turquoise ones. And there are also blue and white elements on the mihrab that also contains um, black line tiles. And I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about these uh, techniques in a, um, a little later. Of course, um, this is only part of a much bigger body of evidence that, should that would have existed. Such and similar tiles may also have been in the palace of Edirne um, and in the old palace in Istanbul, uh, both sites that no longer exist and for which only fragmentary archaeological evidence is available. Although uh, over the last few years, more evidence has emerged from the palace in Edirne that, has, that is being actively excavated. The only extant site from this period with a larger number of blue and white tiles than uh, in the Muradia is the mosque and mausoleum complex of Ghazeddin Khalil Tawrizi in Damascus, built in 1420 to 23, which I will talk about later. Forming a part of a complex, the Muradia is said to have been originally founded as a convent for the Mevlevi order but was turned into a convent mosque by its patron so soon after its completion. Uh, there were also adjoining structures, none of which have been preserved. And there's currently actually a dissertation ongoing by Irem Gündüz Kuzku at Sabanji University in Istanbul, uh, in which uh, the, um, this transformation and function is going to be re-examined uh, based on a very thorough studies of the study of the endowment deed. Uh, for this and other uh, doc, uh, complexes built by the same patron. So new evidence is coming up there as well sometime in the next few years. Entering through the portal, the visitor arrives directly in the monument's main space. On the domes uh, and the walls, uh, several layers of wall paintings have also survived. The oldest, uh, some of which you see here and also here, dating back to the 15th century, probably around the time of uh, construction of the building. Although these, they were at some point covered over uh, and then uh, the walls were repainted 
And these original paintings were not discovered until restoration works in the 1950s. On the day those below the wall paintings, blue and white underglaze painted tiles are applied to the three walls of the Qibla wall, wall um, Ivam, and what you see one of these here. Together with the painted decoration, these tiles probably formed the original decoration of the mosque, although we don't know whether they were installed right when the building was constructed or when it was transformed into a convent mosque. Uh, so we don't know if there is a Mevlevi um, aspect to this decoration. Uh, the crenellations here above the large field of tiles may have been added slightly later because these tiles overlap in part what is believed to be the earliest layer of painted decoration. But there doesn't seem to be any further um, painting, painting underneath this big field of tiles. Uh, now, one, one reason why we know this is because um, in uh, 2001, uh, actually thieves got into this building and uh, stole several of these tiles. So wherever you see the white um, plaster replacement, tiles were actually forcibly removed and uh, stolen, probably sold off on the art market. Uh, the only advantage to this is what that is, it was clear that there's no other painting underneath those tiles. Um, but uh, effectively, if you look at photographs from, uh, earlier decades, you can see that this was uh, very much intact before this, uh, this theft happened. The tiles and the painted decoration point to the interest in Tutmurid art in a period when references in Ottoman architecture reached beyond Anatolia to Iran and Central Asia, but also to Mamluk architecture, as uh, Guru Nechipol notes with regard to monuments such as the Üç Şerefeli Mosque, commissioned by Murad II, which is also located in Edirne, and the Great Mosque of Bursa, commissioned by Sultan Bayezid I. The tile decoration of the Qibla Ivan uh, dominates the space, and the mihrab uh, is a complex combination of both black line tiles, which are sometimes also referred to as uh, cuerda seca, although the technique in this case here is actually not the same um, as it is in uh, the Cuerda Seca produced, uh, for instance, in Spain, where the term, of course, comes from. Um, and there are also blue and light tiles on the mihrab. Now, uh, so in the terms of the technique, uh, and I'm, I'm sure many uh, in this audience are familiar since um, this is uh, really a series specializing in tiles, what is important here is the underglaze painting. That's what used for the blue and white tiles. Um, black line tile, uh, what's the difference is um, between here, between the tiles uh, produced in the Timurid and the Ottoman context and uh, actual Cuerda Seca is that they are using um, a type of, uh, of pigment to create the lines the dividing lines. So they're not using the waxed quartz um, that uh, have led to the term ter cuerda seca. They're using, uh, and I, I can't remember exactly now what's in it. There is, um, there, there are several articles um, about the technique in more detail, and I, I'll be happy to send the references to uh, Rosario and Rafael for anyone who's interested in that. But the effect is the same in that um, here, uh, that you have colors that are very clearly separated from each other because they can't run into each other during firing. Um, and so here, this is an example uh, from Bursa. You can, it's a little hard to see, unfortunately, in this um, size on the screen, but you are left with these um, black uh, outlines, sometimes also red ones. So they use both and it's, it's not totally interchangeable. They're often also used together. Um, the color scheme of these tiles in the Ottoman context is usually um, what you see here, white, uh, dark blue, turquoise, and yellow. Sometimes green is added in as well, as you can see here. Uh, here you also have purple. So there's a little, um, a sort of diff uh, it's a little uh, more in this particular one. Now, one thing that's important uh, to say here is that 
because of the way the mihrab is made, it's very clear that the black line tile and the blue and white um, underglaze were made at the same time. So it's not a case of having an older frame and then uh, just the mukarnas in the um, niche being changed, um, which you can, you can kind of see it here. So uh, because you do have, okay, I don't have the, I, I should have, well, let's see. Okay, there's one slide I should have uh, added, but I should have added a detail uh, here of this section because what happens here is that you have these little, um, let's see, if it's here. no, uh, these little uh, mukarnas niches in the frame here, where part of the decoration on the same piece is black line and part of it is blue and white. And so do you really, they're using, and it's kind of crazy. I, I, I don't, I mean, I'm not a ceramicist, so I don't fully understand how they do this, but they manage to use two entirely distinct techniques on one piece of ceramic and both of them turn out perfectly well. And so this entire mihrab has sections where they are doing this, mixing these two techniques and they're not just, it's, it's really on the same thing. They're not just putting um, putting them together, which is, um, it's just really, really difficult. Apart from the fact that there's also extremely complex motifs done here um with the black line technique so long story short um we have we are looking here at and here's some details of the Abu and white tiles uh we are looking here at the work of tile makers who are really know what they're doing um what we don't know is who they were and uh actually should i should say i, I forgot this number before so Originally, there were uh, four hundred. There were four hundred and seventy nine of these um, hexagonal tiles in the site. Some of which have uh, since been stolen, as I mentioned. Uh, but it is a, it is a very large number that was uh, produced, as far as we know, specifically for this for this building. Um, again, uh, the palace is uh, Ottoman Palace of Edirne was very close to the site, so it is possible that similar things exist there. However, the archaeological evidence so far hasn't turned up large number of these uh, large numbers of these from the palace. This can also be due to the fact that the palace, of course, continued to be used into the 19th century and was con constantly redecorated. So um, that evidence doesn't I mean, it doesn't really uh, tell us all that much, um, essentially. Now. The motifs on the in, uh, uh, individual tiles vary quite a bit, but fall into roughly three categories. The first are floral motifs that revolve around the central point, uh, things like these, where you have uh, sort of six around um, the edge and one in the center. Um, then you have floral motifs where you have a bigger central motif and sort of a, a like here or here, and then a rough axial, axial symmetry around them. And then you have tiles with different types of geometric motifs, like this ones here. Um, the tiles with the floral motifs are examples of what the Ottomans uh, call hitai, which is uh, the term Ottoman sources use to talk about motifs derived from Chinese sources. Um, the opposing term to this is Rumi, uh, which means um, inspired by the Islamic heritage of Rum, which is Anatolia. And I'll just go back to show you an example here. So these palmettes, for instance, that's that would be typical Rumi uh, motifs. Interestingly, those don't appear on the blue on the blue and white tile. So it is a somewhat different aesthetic, actually. Um, but they're being used together in one project. So these are not mutually exclusive. They very much work together. Now, the same approach um, of using uh, Rumi and Hittai motifs together appear elsewhere in early Ottoman architecture, particularly in the so-called um, green mosque and mausoleum uh, in Bursa, which were built for Ottoman Sultan Mehmet I in the early 15th century. Now we do not have blue and white tiles uh, on at uh, these sites, 
but they're important. Um, and I'll show you these here. So, so it's all black line tiles in both sides together which is monochrome turquoise uh, on the lower sections of the walls uh these are in, oh sorry i should have um these um sites are important because um the mihrab of the mosque is signed by a group by a group of tile makers who call themselves the masters of tabris um and what happens is then that this master of tabris label is being applied to any site um, within the Ottoman realm uh, in the fifth across the 15th century that has any sort of black line tiles showing up. Why does this matter for um, our narrative today? Because of course in the Muradia you have um, the blue white blue and white tiles together with the black line tiles. And all of it becomes attributed to the masters of Tabriz because the label is available uh, from one, uh, and I have to emphasize this, a single signature in a single site. Um, it doesn't appear elsewhere and uh, the name of the group doesn't appear in any other uh, Ottoman written source at all. Now, it is of course tempting uh, to use the suggestion of a single uh, traveling workshop, but we really don't know if um, it was one group that produced what you see here in Bursa, um, what you what we just saw in Ederne, uh, and what is also attributed to the group is um, this mihrab, who was um, produced not for the Ottomans, but for the uh, rulers of Karaman, one of the biggest revival rivals of the Ottomans in the 15th century until um, the 1470s. Um, it's just, the, it's one mihrab, um, which was removed from uh, its site, the Ibrahim Bey Imaret in Karaman, um, and is now look, is, was taken to the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. The biggest difference between this and um, the work in uh, Bursa and Ederne is that the central part of the mihrab here is um, clad just with monochrome um, dark purple tiles rather than black line. But around here, you again have uh, black line tiles. The one, there's one problem in all of this is of chronology because the sites um, where you find these tiles in Bursa are built between 1419 and 1426. Um, in Ederne, you have the tiles appearing in 1429 in a site I haven't showed you because they're no longer in situ, um, and in 1435. And then you have this site here in Karaman in 1432. So you can't also build a neat narrative where they say, okay, they start working in Bursa, Oh, there's no more. There's no more work there. Okay, they move to Edirne. Oh, the Ottomans get bored to them. They go to Karaman. That's not what's happening, clearly. Um, so if it's all the same people, they move around in a very strange way, um, which is what actually made me first question this narrative of the one workshop moving around. And the other one, I mean, the other aspect that makes it difficult is actually a technical one because if you think about that, they would have to. Um, each time they move, rebuild all their kilns, rebuild their entire production site. And of course, we're talking about royal patronage here. And there's an insane amount of money, but it just doesn't seem, it's also not particularly efficient to do this, right? It's also not necessary because we have other examples um, of, of tiles being produced in one location and shipped. Uh, in the Islamic world, the most famous example is certainly the site of Kashan in Iran, which um, is act, has tile production from the late 12th to the mid 14th century. Uh, they produce both vessels and tiles, and they ship the tiles to, uh, to sites that are, um, some of which are more than 1,000 kilometers away from Kashan. So it's, it's totally doable. Um, it's also done in the Ottoman context uh, once you have uh, production in Iznik in full swing starting in the second quarter of the 16th century, they produce tiles for um, Ottoman monuments exclusively in Iznik and ship them from there to, to places all across the empire. 
Um, and yet here in the literature on this on these um, tiles, um, you have this singular emphasis on uh, the mastery of Tabriz as an as an workshop who are wandering around. Um, the second question is with, uh, is of course, well, how do they um, acquire the knowledge of all of a sudden producing blue and white, right? Um, and why do they not do it before if it's the same group? Now, there, uh, I mean, one hypothesis has to do with Iznik, um, which has ceramic production since at least the 14th century. There's even ceramics being produced in Iznik before the Ottomans conquered the city. Um, and there is the so-called um, Miletus ware, which um, scholars used to think was produced in Miletus, uh, hence the name, um, but which uh, it has now be has become clear in the meantime that it was actually produced in Iznik as well, very early by the late 14th century. And that is earthenware, um, no tiles, just vessels, but with blue and white underglaze painted decoration. So maybe it's a new, so maybe there is a new sort of um, workshop coming together to produce this particular um, decoration, or maybe they're getting tiles from different places. I and mean, it's kind of, the mihrab is what makes it tricky because the mihrab is kind of, makes it very clear that um, the people who are doing it, who are making it are proficient in two very different techniques. And they're clearly, it's clearly whole planned together and it's clearly made together. Um, and so it's like a very, an instance of very specialized production. Now, the fact that it is not repeated though, maybe also shows that it was very difficult. I don't know. Um, it, they didn't do this again for whatever reason. Uh, and so uh, was it just impractical? Was it too expensive? Um, was it, did they just decide that the aesthetic was not, um, what they wanted for future sites, we we don't really uh, we we don't really know that, right? Um, sorry, now I have to. Okay, here. Now, before I move to Mamluk material, uh, I wanted to uh, show you a few more Ottoman examples. Um, the closest in chronology to the Muradia is the Utsher Efeli Mosque in Edirne, which was also commissioned by Ottoman Sultan Murad II. Now this site has very little extant tile decoration, all, all, only the two uh, lunettes you see here. Um, <laughs> although uh, these were um, probably reassembled at a later point from the fragments of a much larger number of um, of similar of, of identical ones that had been uh, damaged uh, in an earthquake. Edirne is susceptible to earthquake damage, and particularly in um, the mid uh, in 1752, there was a very large earthquake. After which, extensive restorations were made to this mosque uh, and other buildings in the city. And so, it is entirely possible that they sort of uh, mix and match fragments um, because you can see. Here, the frame, in some places it's white, here it's blue, uh, here you have blue and white, and then you have um, sort of throughout, you have different colors being mixed together. Um, both of, uh, and uh, they are, otherwise the panels are identical, right? The color scheme's different, but uh, it's the same inscription, uh, the same border motif. And so these were very clearly made with the same stencil um uh which are uh sort of a, a paper template that's um uh has little has little prick needle prick holes in it and then is laid over the tile you sprinkle coal dust on it and you take it off very gently and that's what gives you the outline to then paint um paint on the decoration that's what's uh what, how they're doing this um for uh sort of very complex calligraphies such as this Go ahead. Now, um, Sandra Aub recently suggested that the two uh, tile lunettes at the Utscherefeli Mosque may have been made by the same workshop that produced these two uh, uh, lunettes that are in the courtyard of Mehmed II's mosque in Istanbul, 
built between 1463 and 70. These two panels are located over courtyard windows um, and they are actually the only 15th century tiles that remain in that mosque, which was very heavily damaged in an earthquake in 1766. So there too, we're talking about very fragmentary uh, evidence. Uh, it's here too, it uh, seems likely that fragments of different panels were actually assembled into, uh, into these two. Now it's worth noting here, that um, the color scheme in these is expanded, right? You also have yellow now appearing in underglazed painted tiles, which just doesn't happen earlier, but it is actually using uh, now a, the same color scheme as black line tiles, with very few of which are produced this late. Um, so there's also something happening in terms of the techniques. Um, Now, um, I'm not entirely con convinced actually that Dr. Dr. Aub is right with her suggestion also because um, she does not particularly well account for the difference of 30 years in between. So if we're talking the same workshop, right? You still, you're still at least one generation, perhaps two generations down the line. And it's not very clear how that would uh, function. Um, there is also much missing from our narratives about tiles in Istanbul. Um, we know that tile production in Istanbul was likely uh, well established by the 1460s for the construction of um, the old palace and later uh, top couple palace. Um, and also probably for the mosque of Mehmet uh, II, but we don't have much of the evidence. Um, what we have more of in Istanbul, I'm just showing you one example here, is sort of the mid 16th century full fledged Iznik tiles, right? Um, the Rustem Pasha Mosque in Istanbul is probably the most famous example because it has a uh, very extensive tile um, decoration. So there is certainly also, and these are made in Iznik, but uh, there's certainly also in this and the earlier period also production in Istanbul about which uh, we know very little. At the same time, it's also we also know that um, tile makers from Iran or Central Asia were present in Istanbul um, because we, there is a petition by um, tile cutters who sign they sign as um, tile literally tile cutters from Khorasan, as um, Guru Nechipol has shown, uh, and they make tile mosaic. They may have made the tile mosaic. Um, of the Tinili uh, which is sort of um, the single sort of the one um, example of tile mosaic you have in Ottoman architecture in Istanbul. Um, but what else they made, we don't know, but it does show that there is, um, so you, yes, you do have uh, workers coming in um, and you have a sort of tile production uh, by uh, people who are operating within the Ottoman realm and then ones who are coming, uh, who are migrating in at various um, points in time. We also have um, the use of gilded uh, tiles, sort of monochrome tiles with gold overlay. Now, what you, where you can see it very well, it has been uh, restored. Um, in other cases, a lot of it has rubbed off. Um, so there's a really uh, very, very rich um, move, sort of um, tile production. Now, where the Masters of Tabriz narrative comes in again uh, is, a site, is this site, um, which is part of the large cemetery of uh, Murat II's Mosque Savia in Bursa where you have lots and lots of uh, mausolea for uh, various members of the Ottoman dynasty. Uh, I'm starting with this um, particular mausoleum because it has along these borders here, some of what um, Nurhan Atasoy and Julian Rabi um, think uh, were sort of the last, um, very last efforts of the workshop tradition of the masters of Tabriz. So they're sort of drawing this narrative into uh, the 14, uh, well, 1460s, 
1470s, um, what makes it interesting for us is that there's also one uh, very odd blue and white tile in the site right here. So it's, it's here and this is the detail. Um, and there's really, there's really very, there's really nothing in the autumn context that compares to it. So what is it doing there? Um, it's, uh, and it, the whole thing being um, way more uh, complicated by the fact that this um, site, as this particular mausoleum was built in 1479, but it was also probably redecorated 20 years later when um, Prince Jem, the brother of uh, Sultan Weiss II was buried there. Uh, so what if this is 1470s? What if this is 1490s? We're not totally sure. Now, what we also have in Bursa are these few blue and white underglazed painted tiles, um, which appear on a kenotaph uh, from the 1450s. Um, they, uh, I, I thought initially that maybe these were overstock from the Muradia in Edirne, uh, because they're not totally perfect. You can see how this is not this is not the picture being blurry. It's the um the blue that bled during firing. So maybe there were uh, these were left over from another site. Now they're they're probably not from uh from Ethernet, from the Muradian Ethernet, just because tiles there don't have this um blue border along the edges. So they're a little different. Uh, but this may be an instance of tiles being produced in some place and then uh, reused elsewhere because there's too few of them um, on the site. Now, if we go back um, to the Muradia in Edirne, and I should have showed you this slide of the site here earlier. So you have a mosque, Savia, here, and then all these other domes are mausolea. Um, the decoration of the Mosque Zavia has these tile fields uh, below here, which is mostly tile mosaic. Um, the mihrab and the whole upper section no longer survive. Um, once more, this is earthquake damage from uh, the 19th century. But you do have underneath the porch um, a little bit, again, of sort of a black line tile um, together with tile mosaic in this case, uh, which I mean, again, makes it tricky. So this is also attributed to the masters of Tabriz. So did they then also make tile mosaic? Yeah, maybe they did. And maybe this was someone else, right, making all of this. Um, but uh, if you move further on in the site, you all of a sudden, in the early 16th century, get very different blue and white tiles. These are, they're only border tiles in two mausolea um, here, uh, these borders here. And they have the motifs that are known um, in the Ottoman context as Baba Nakash motifs after an album um, where similar motifs are drawn on paper and are attributed, although not signed by, a workshop leader um, who goes by the name Baba Nakash. Now, Baba Nakash is not a person's name. It's like a, um, it means father designer. So it's like an, an epithet, right? Um, but these function in different colors. Here's a sort of a, a different version. Um, and the same motifs are being used in different materials. You have them in wood and metalwork, on paper and textiles. So this is as a way, a, a, a point in time where the Ottomans have um, these kind of motifs uh, across um, different uh, buildings. And they're also used um, on ceramic vessels. Uh, the most famous is probably uh, the Abraham of Kutahia Iuver in the British Museum, which is dated 1510. So we're here firmly in the early 16th century. Um, and so there's still a lot to be done, uh, more to be done, I think, in terms of the late relationship between um, vessels and tiles. Um, also because for the early 16th century, honestly, we have much more vessels uh, in blue and white that are being produced and that are very well studied by uh, Walter Denny, Nurhan Atasoy, uh, Julian Raby. There's a whole uh, like big uh, chunk of scholarship of production, um, like studying the production leading up to the 16th century uh, sort of standard. Um, isn't it? Now, if we move uh, finally uh, to the Mamluk context, uh, 
the, the evidence appears mostly in Cairo and Damascus, although um, more of the evidence in Cairo is uh, in archaeological context rather than on tiles that remain in buildings that are still standing. Um, in Damascus, the central example is in the interior of uh, this site, the mosque uh, and mausoleum of Razeddin uh, Khalil at Tabrizi, um, which is sort of the um, across the site of each other. Now, here uh, you do have um, tiles that are installed in various ways. And you can already see from this slide that they are actually of very different kinds. Um, why this this I'm showing you this first because it is signed uh, right here. Uh, you have uh, the signature uh, saying the work of Ghaibi Tawrizi. Now Tawrizi, um, the Arabic uh, were, um, sort of as a uh, place of origin in Arabic means from Tabriz. So again, we have somebody saying um, I'm from Tabriz and I'm making blue and white tiles, although these are actually blue and white and black and purple. So there's all kinds of different things going on here. Um, and some of them are installed with the triangles in between, like in the Muradi and others um, stuck together. Now, um, uh, I should also say there are actually over 1,500 tiles across the mausoleum and mosque. Michael Meinecke has suggested um, that the tiles may actually not have been produced for this patron, um, but reused from other sites, uh, some of them perhaps from um, the Umayyad Great Mosque in Damascus, where um, Meinecke uh, argues blue and white tiles were probably commissioned for a restoration in the 1410s. Um, uh, although no, actually no, uh, but no such tiles remain in, in the Great Mosque. Uh, however, considering that the large number of these, these kind of tiles uh, purchased by European and Arab American collections in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century were said to have come from Damascus, it is actually possible that some of these reached the art market after um, a fire that destroyed much of the great mosque's interior in the 1890s. Uh, so that's entirely plausible. And it's also uh, seems quite clear that there is a lot of um, patchwork going on in this site in Damascus so that you have probably have sort of different types of production that are being assembled in this site. But it does show that blue and white underglaze painted tiles are a thing uh, in 15th century Damascus. Um, and there's other examples as well that uh, Meinig has published about. A set of tiles uh, that you see here at the Shmoli Museum um, has been assembled into this panel, uh, but it's unclear whether this arrangement was original um, or whether uh, or whether they were so, they were sort of assembled uh, in this way to be sold. The tiles here are all uh, blue and black without the turquoise you know, using in some examples. And you can see there, sort of the aesthetic here, it's, it's, it's really different from the Ottoman ones. These are probably drawn freehand. Um, and so they're kind of harder to compare. But then there are others like these, uh, which are also attributed to Damascus, but have um, motifs that are much more similar to what we saw in the Muradi and Ederne. So there's sort of a, uh, especially, I'm especially sort of thinking about these kind of compositions here. Um, and so there is, is sort of, it was clearly not the same workshops and same people producing it, but it's sort of a shared aesthetic interest in these types of tiles. Um, and then there's these panels, um, which are sometimes attributed to the Mosque of Razadin Taurizi that I showed you in Damascus, um, but this is purely based on the fact that they are blue and white and said to be from Damascus. So I think, um, I mean, these deserve a lot more investigation. And this is, these, I haven't, um, I haven't done any further research on these, but uh, probably should. Uh, now in Cairo, uh, the production, um, what is sort of uh, confusing our narrative is the fact that there are several vessels 
um, some of which like these excavated in Cairo that have um, signatures by Raibi. Uh, and this one says Raibi on the base, uh, on the foot underneath, and then the center, which is what you have seen when this was a bowl, um, says the work of uh, the son, Ibn Raibi. In her study of Mamluk, uh, uh, um, uh, based on these signatures, uh, Jen uh, Marilyn Jenkins Medina suggests that Raibi Tabrizi moved to Cairo um, where he signed some work also as Raibi Ashami, so Raibi from Damascus rather than from Tabriz. Um, and that the signature Ibn Raibi, son of Raibi, uh, suggests continuing production. And there's uh, examples of these signatures both on tiles and on vessels as well. The, a mosque lamp uh, that you see here is also signed uh, Ibn Raibi at Tabrizi. So that, um, that sort of uh, origin point to Tabriz appears once more. Uh, when assessing uh, these signatures, it's important to note, as Yui Kanda emphasizes, that the signatures are not all done in the same hand. Uh, and there's a range of signatures belonging to other potters that are also found on uh, underglazed blue and white pottery uh, excavated in Cairo, which uh, clarified that there was a much larger production. Kanda uh, uh, was able to, to establish uh, so succession of apprentices who were uh, very likely trained in Raibi's workshop, uh, and so um, argues that you have sort of a large workshop where Raibi is clearly an important figure running a large workshop, but has other people working uh, with him uh, on both tiles and vessels. Now, I'll, I'll, move, I'll slowly move to the conclusion because I know I've been going for a longer time than I thought I would. Uh, and I'll skip over this, but I'd be happy to talk about um, this tile mihrab. Um, now, one piece of the picture that I'm uh, not talking about today um, is the evidence from Tabriz itself. Um, there is, there is, I mean, Tabriz is, is sort of difficult in the, because there's, um, really nothing from the early 15th century that survives there. There is much better evidence from the mid 50, 15th century and later um, for black line tile, for tile mosaic and for blue and white on the glaze painted tiles. Um, this is something Sandra Oop has uh, worked on in much detail and um, the article in Mukarnas that is cited uh, on the slide is where um, these images come from and where she really uh, discusses how this works in Tabriz. So that's kind of a, the, that's sort of another part uh, of this bigger picture. And so what, what really happens is that we are um, in the 15th century, uh, see a prol proliferation of blue and white tiles produced in the Ottoman Mamluk realms that bend the questions of how many centers of production uh, we are dealing with. Um, certainly Cairo, most likely Damascus, um, and then probably Iznik and Edirne and Bursa and Istanbul either all at once or sort of periodically in certain um, decades. Indeed, we are dealing with an aesthetic shift related to the increased availability in the Middle East of Chinese Ming porcelain with blue, white, and white glazes. It is plausible that this interest arose concurrently in the Ottoman and Mamluk realms, considering their close diplomatic ties during this period, and the competitive climate that emerged in the production not only of ceramics, but also of other objects such as manuscripts and carpets. The late 14th and early 15th centuries had seen an, a period of increased contact between the Mamluks and Ottomans as Timur began, began to encroach on their realms, even if conflict was not necessarily avoided uh, between conflict with the Mamluks and Ottomans. As for instance, seen in uh, based at the first conquest of Malatya, which was previously occupied by the Mamluks in 1400. Following a hiatus during Timur's conquest of Anatolia uh, and the Ottoman dynastic interregnum from 1402 to 1413, contact between the Mamluks and Ottomans increased again during the reigns of Mehmed I and Murad II. 
it, considering these close contacts, it is plausible that workers moved between the realms and that tiles and pottery were traded between them. The two options are not mutually exclusive, even though the presence of signed tiles in Myanmar usually leads to the assumption that tiles were produced right there in the presence of those who, who signed, but this is perhaps something we also um, need, to be, need to be questioning more in the future. Uh, and I'll stop here. Uh, I should also say that um, I have uh, I published uh, a version of this in much more detail uh, in Mukarnas in uh, 2019. Um, I'd happy to send this to anyone who is interested, or I can also uh, I can also send it to uh, Rafael and Rosario directly, so they have it to share with anyone uh, who would want to see it. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. It was uh, it was really nice to to hear you. Um, so if anyone has questions, you can write it down on the chat or press the hand button and do the questions yourself as you like. I have a question. It's more like a curiosity. I don't know um, if the shape of uh, the hexagonal, it's a typical shape or why they use it so much. I don't know. Is there any reason or a special reason? I don't know. It's just I mean, good or question. not at all. No, it's uh, it's it's a good question. I'm not sure anyone has explained it for tiles actually. Okay, um, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a shape. It appears a lot in geometric ornament, right? Okay. And so it's maybe pulled out from that because if you think okay. about these sort of geometric bands of polygon intersecting polygons, so it's, it's yeah. sort of a very common shape. Um, yeah. But then in a, way, in a way for tiles, why not just make squares? It's so much Yeah, easier. because in Portuguese, in Portugal, we are so used to, to the square form or no. Yeah, so. and that's what the Ottomans <laughs> it's moved so to. And that's what the Ottomans moved to um, starting in the 1520s. So that the, the regular Isnik tiles, they're all squares. I mean, not yeah. all of them, but they're either squares or rectangles or sometimes yeah. lots of L, like I mean, sort of longer uh, border tiles of elongated okay. shapes. Yeah. But the polygon shapes go away. Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe because it's just easier um, to do it that way. I don't know. Okay. I mean, it's, it gives you a different way of, although, and the, although, sorry, I should sort of a design aspect to it is actually the polygonal ones. They have designs that are contained in one tile. In one tile, okay. Sort of that are finite within one tile, and so you have a different picture, if you will, on each tile. Okay. For the Ottoman context, once they move to the rectangular ones, you have mm -hmm. continuous motifs. Ah, okay. So you can assemble the tiles however you want, and you can can continue indefinitely, and you can do half a wall, whole wall, very okay. often the flower motifs that extend over entire walls. So it's Maybe it's something to do with that, that this sort of this aesthetic shift, but um, just guessing here. Okay, just just, uh, just another question about the under glazed technique. It's like, I don't know, but I think we are used to rajola, like Valencian tiles that they are have the same technique, which is mm -hmm. under the glazed. So it's curious to, to see at the same time in different places uh, uh, tile interest in production are using different techniques, uh, the same techniques, I mean, um, but in the different contexts. And yeah. it's, uh, it's quite amazing. I think. Yeah, and for underglaze, I'm not, I'm not sure where it's first developed, actually. Um, yeah. So they are much earlier within the Islamic world. They're much earlier examples. Yeah. Of yes, yes, yes. Is there a logic to apply uh, um, the different motives on the wall? It doesn't seem so. I mean, in the in the Murandia, I I don't think so because they're they're not distributed in any regular way, mm. um, and there's not enough other examples that you could compare. Um, because otherwise, I mean, it's otherwise it's it, sort of the sequence is very clear if you're dealing with inscriptions, um, or if you have something like a mihrab where you want these frames mm -hmm. and you want the mukarnas in the middle and the niche in the middle and and things like that. But for sort of 
um, the entire walls, not so much. It gets a bit more struck, like the so examples like the Rustem Pasha Mosque later on, it's sort of a little bit more structures where it's sort of a, a big field of the same tiles with motifs and then a border around and things like that. But um, seems to be mostly sort of based on aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing things rather than um, uh, more so than tr than creating symmetry or anything like that. Thank you. Just another curiosity: um, the golden tiles uh, you you showed, um, they are painted on the glaze, or not? Or yes, it's over glaze. Yes, which is which is why it it's not very well preserved because it rubs off very easily. That's sort of it's 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 very very fragile. Yeah. It's very interesting because uh, next uh, Azul obsession uh, will be exactly uh, about these uh, in Portuguese tiles. The, oh, the, I'll have to listen in. Um, I think we have questions in the chat, Rafaela. Yeah, did you see any differences between the blues in different places? If so, there is any explanation? Um, I mean, just by by looking at them, I think they look very different. They do look different. The ones in um, in Damascus look darker than um, the the ones in um, in uh, in Edirne. Now, there hasn't been full anal technical analysis of any of these, um, but if that were done, uh, I'm pretty sure you'd actually get. Um, quite similar significant differences because already uh look at like visually they're quite different um and there's a good chance that there's pretty significant um technical differences uh as well um there's um a, a, a scholar at Koch University in Istanbul uh called Gusu Franchi who has been doing some uh, XRF analysis of some uh, Seljuk and Ottoman tiles within Turkey. So she does. She hasn't done any comparison with the Mamluk stuff, um, but it is. I mean, it is possible to do sort of non-invasive um, analysis of these things, uh, and then actually realize that even in the glazes, there um, there are differences. And then once you start looking at the body of the tiles, it gets even more. Um, you get even more differences. Um, and I just put my uh, article in Mukarnas into the chat. Uh, if someone wants to try to download it, if it actually works, I'm not sure it does, but it, it might. <laughs> so I'll have to thank Patricia once again for your presentation and for your time and for sharing so many knowledge. And uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and I'll see you on the next Aslab. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. <laughs>